Bulls do go fast. So what exactly? Hello, everybody, and welcome to the CPL Civ 6 weekly podcast. This is number 24. I'm Sarnath. Joining me, as always, is King Louis XIV, and our guests tonight include Blade 7 and Canuck Soldier. Go ahead and introduce yourselves, gentlemen. How's it going, guys? Glad to be back. Hey, guys. Good to be back after a while. Hopefully, uh, we'll have a very interesting discussion tonight. Hello, it's uh, me, as usual, King Louis, chilling like I always do in the podcast. So we have tons to go over. As all of you know, we had a, an update from the developers, and oh my god, it didn't include a DLC. Who'd have thought? And, well, man, there's just so much packed into these patch notes. The video they put up just did not do it justice at all. Yeah, I'm looking at the patch notes right now, and there's quite a few little changes to the game. They, uh balance like the tourism in the late game for like the arena and the zoo and the stadium uh they clarified different tags added eurekas uh took away a couple agendas so i mean it's quite a few details on here don't know if you're gonna linking the patch notes to the stream but i would do recommend you reading this oh they're up right now yeah, I'm really happy that we didn't have to wait for a DLC, that uh, Fire Axis decided to move ahead with developer updates. So hopefully, maybe we can get one of these every few weeks from now, uh, you know, in uh, Rise and Fall without having to wait for DLCs. It's more of a UI patch, isn't it, than a, than a balance change? It's got a little bit of everything, to be honest. As those of you watching right now, you can see how we have... One of the biggest things that cracked me up, if you guys have been on the uh, various subreddits for Civ 6, I've highlighted it, remove the flirtatious and curmudgeon agendas. When people saw that, there was a whole lot of, the, the hell is this? <laughs> Reaction from the community. Like, why does the leader's sexuality have anything to do with this? And it, I'm glad to see it removed, just because it seemed completely ridiculous to me. I, I just don't understand why that would be a factor. You mean there was something in there where, where the a woman leader would be would have a, would be flirtatious? That was like something in there. Yeah, that would, that would be an agenda option. I mean, it's been removed now, but I mean, we don't uh, we don't deal with the the AI civs too much around here. But so it, you know, civ agendas aren't a big you know issue for us. But it is an interesting uh, um, you know I guess politically correct decision on their part. I'm not sure if they got any feedback from uh, the, the Civ community at large about uh, these things, but I guess someone must have uh, complained enough that they removed it. Yeah, it's kind of. I don't remember them doing that in the other Civ games. Are there Civ games that didn't have agendas? Well, that's true. Yeah. Well, that's. I mean, there's tons of stuff here. I'm slowly scrolling through the list for our viewers out there, whether you're joining us on Twitch, YouTube, live, or over on Binks TV. It's just been... It's absolutely incredible to read through this another time. Because, you know, you read through something, like a long list like this a couple times, and you miss a lot of it, and you come back, you're like, whoa, wait, what is this? Like, how did I miss this? Macedon no longer receives booze for conquering a free city. That's a huge kick in the nuts for Macedon, because they were really abusing the hell out of that. Well, I mean, you take over a city, you get the free Eurekas for it, you back out of the city, don't build the monument, don't uh, put a governor in there, it flips in, what, three to five turns or so, and then you retake it again. And so every three to five turns, you're able to keep getting boost after boost after boost. So... Of course, they're going to fix that because it was kind of an exploit with Mastodon. So I, Did I, they fix the thing with the double horses or double archer bounce with Nubia and Scythia? Did they fix any of those things? What are you talking about? The double, you get the double horses with Scythia, like when you're building in the oh. double arch. They, they did fix any of those? Well, that's not a bug for Scythia. That's intended. That's, the, but that's the, her but intended the, ability. But they, I thought everybody agrees they should fix it, so I, that, that they still haven't addressed that, you're saying? It's still the same? That, that, 
Well, you got to realize uh, on, that uh, there's game balance issues, and primarily they're worried about balancing the game for single player, um, not multiplayer. But it may be something that Rip Panda can solve in our upcoming uh, uh, league mod that he's working on. But honestly, right now, the meta has changed to where, like, I don't feel Scythia's double horse ability is all that overpowered because you have swords which are incredibly stronger than horses. So you're seeing a lot more people go swords with double oligarchy. And so I don't think Scythia is all that bad anymore. So wait, what happened with the, I guess I'm not building swordsmen. What, what did they do to the swordsmen to make them, make them better? Okay, you know, you have your oligarchy, which is plus four combat strength, right? Mm -hmm. Well, if you build your government plaza building, or your, your government plaza district, and you put the building in there, and you have oligarchy, you get a purple card, which is a plus four to all melee units, which include naval melee. And so now you have oligarchy with the policy card, so your swords are now plus eight strength automatically. And then you add in any visibility, you add in any defense modifiers, any um, flanking bonuses, and you're looking at like 57 strength swords. Or it's whatever. only from that city. It's only from the city that your government plaza's in, but you just pump them all out from... And oh. it's melee, so they can't. you can't get that with horses in, right? So It's on all melee units in the entire game. All but isn't the horse considered... A, horse unit's not considered melee unit, is it? A horse, no, it's horse like cavalry. cavalry. Yeah, so it's so the horse don't don't won't get this this bonus, right? Exactly. Only 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 yeah. So that so that okay, I see this. So that's really nerfed the horses then some a good bit then. So if somebody rushes horses and comes after you, and all you do is you build warriors and you upgrade to swords, and now he can't really push into you. You get a general. You get and off the time we we play with. The general A means your general can't leave your border. So now you have a defense general. You put Mag or not Magnus, uh, Victor in there with the first promotion. That's another plus five. If you happen to be in a dark age, that's an additional plus five. If you use the Twilight Valor card, so you're looking at like a automatic plus twenty five on top of the sword. So your swords are your swords could beat cavalry in a sense. Your swords are going to start one-shotting those horses. Exactly. Damn, I got to start... Yeah, I was totally oblivious to that. I got to start doing this... Building these uh, power powerhouse swordsmen then. So, Scythia is not all that great anymore. The issue now with Scythia see... is not the double horses. It's healing on unit kill and then getting a combat adv strength advantage over wounded units. But with the changes to how you make money... From the city state envoy change to the trader change, you're not going to be able to finance all of those horses you're building. So the yeah, that the healing on top of kills is incredibly strong. It's what a plus thirty now, but I mean it's still not warranted to, in my opinion, ban her anymore. But, I mean, she's been banned for over a year in all of our games, so it's just that knee-jerk reaction now. Yeah, it, it's more muscle memory. Uh, I'm not in favor of a lot of these bans that, that a lot of our players are doing. A lot of it's just, well, I've always banned Scythia. It must be bad. Yep. It Now you see Rome pretty much always banned, and you, Congo is incredibly strong with his unique uh, sword because, like, to stop the all, double all oligarchy swords, you need crossbows. And, of course, his unique unit has a defense modifier versus ranged. So crossbows don't really work. Nope. Well, speaking of things changing, I'm being better. How about the Entertainment Center changes? I've left this on screen for a little bit while we were talking. Now, the arena, plus one culture, plus one tourism, one's com com wow. conservation, English, hard. Oh my god. 
plus one entertainment amenity for the city. Now, observation comes super late. But plus one culture, awesome. The amenity was always a thing. The zoo gives plus one science to all rainforest and marsh tiles in the city. And then, the, and then, of course, as always, the plus one amenity for all cities and six tiles. Okay. You combine that with, like, the chicken? The chicken The chick denitsa? I call it the chicken. <laughs> but you combine that with the chicken, and, like, your rainforests are incredibly strong, and so Brazil is great for that, because, especially because Brazil has the unique district. The only difference is you're not going to be able to chop all those rainforests, which I always do now. It just depends. I mean, with Brazil, you're going to leave some, but you always chopped a good deal of your rainforests in Brazil anyway to really make the most of where you would put that fat plus six, you know, commercial or campus. You just get some ridiculous bonuses with Brazil. And you'd always have to eat a couple of rainforest tiles to make it happen anyway. So they really weren't slowed down at all. And then the stadium on here, I mean, I hardly ever see plus 20 cities, but you get two tourism for cities with at least 10 population, plus five tourism to cities with at least 20 population, and of course, plus two entertainment amenities for cities within six tiles. So, How often are you getting a city with a 20 population? It's a lot more often now than it used to be, Louis. Because building taller is now better in Rise and Fall. And we can argue wide versus tall all you want. But there's also so much more housing available from so many different sources now that you didn't really see before. And that's because we're forced to make all of these district improvements sooner. Markets for trade routes. Libraries to get the Science City State bonus from our envoys. And because of that, a lot more of our cities are hitting those population thresholds sooner. Yeah, I like that one wonder that gives you, what, plus four housing and plus three... Uh, was it plus four housing and some amenities? Or no, it's like temple plus of four. Artemis. Are about the government plaza building? No, the one that no, gives you plus four food and plus Artemis. three housing or plus... Plus, plus four housing, plus three food, and then you get, and it gives you amenity for every uh, pasture that's near it. Pasture, camp, and plantation, and it's the Temple You're of Artemis is Artemis? incredibly strong. Yes, that's exactly what he's talking about, and it's incredible. I saw, I was casting a match last week, and I got to see a plus six amenity Artemis drop really early, mind you. And it was it was strong enough to be considered a coliseum at that point. Yeah, that's I, I like that's one of my favorite ones to build, definitely. Yeah, the game I played yesterday, I did Artemis with Coliseum. All my luxuries that were in my land with my teammates because I did not need amenities at all. I was plus four in all my cities. So, I mean, Artemis, if you have... One thing I've noticed, though, is that camps are a lot harder to come by. Like, I'm looking through my entire land area, and, like, I don't have any deer, I don't have any fur, so I, like, I have a lot of pastures and plantations and everything, but I struggle to actually place down Artemis, which is kind of odd. It definitely goes to show how some of these new wonders have really impacted the game. Because sacrificing early production to throw up a wonder is a really huge investment, especially if you may not get it. And you know, but for Sibs, like for example, the Dutch, or even, um. I mean, there's just so many civs gain so much from these new wonders you can construct. And a lot of the old ones have been improved, such as the Great Library. Still not the Great Library, it's the kind of okay, decent downtown library now. But it's getting there. 
it, it's still pretty shit. <laughs> it, it, I, I did library, say it was the downtown library. Come on. <laughs> if the great library got put back on writing, it'd be so much better. But the it's on... Uh, what the hell is that name of that tech? Or civic, I should say. It's not civil service. It's one before civil service. It, it, that just comes too far. And by the time you get that, you basically have the boost to everything already. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, but it is what it is in that regard. And to move things along in this direction, it, like... What did you guys think about when he did the developer video? Now, it's not listed in the patch notes for some reason, but city-states now get a bonus production toward walls, have a stronger... I didn't see it, I must have read over it. But have bonus production towards walls and have a much stronger combat strength starting the game. This impacts everybody, because everyone likes bashing city-states. Not just the AI, but we do as players too, because the AI is really bad at war. So we like free cities. Yeah, it was in it was in the developer's video. He uh, he went over that. It, it's definitely an interesting change. So what's the exact change? They just made them a little stronger, or what, what's the change for the city? They states? have uh, like when you first start out, your city strength is plus ten, and I think a city state is default plus seventeen, and they build walls really really quickly so i mean they have walls and they're at about a plus 28 strength that just have a warrior and the the one thing that jumped out of me i saw somebody talking about is like the your range units if they're behind a wall now they, they get the two range no matter what the terrain is yes they are now considered to always have high ground advantage which makes if sense because walls. you're standing on a wall I shouldn't have something a problem else, hitting you on a hill. There's a wall and something else. There's some other tech that if you research, you also get it, but I forget what it was. It's the urban defenses bonus that you're thinking of, and it comes at steel. And it gives oh. all of your cities maximum strength walls automatically if they don't have them built already. And basically... That's, that's probably one of the biggest balance changes, isn't it? That plus... T I mean, the, the the range units getting the automatic plus two every time, that's going to be... A, it I think honestly that's gonna be... sounds like something that should have always been there. It never really sat well with me that if I have walls and my archer's on a wall, why does he have trouble hitting you on a hill if he's on a wall? I mean, he's not shooting from the ground behind the wall. If he is, he's being ridiculous. He needs to be smacked. But, <laughs> but yeah, I so, used to use that and like hide behind like wooded hills and the city not be able to attack me. But now the city can attack all six tiles, guaranteed which I like. So they've done a lot for defense, which I like. I'm, I'm glad because I'm more of a, a less aggressive player. So I like that they've added all like, you know, like the victor will help you with the defense, the governor. And I like that they've oh, done yeah. a lot of things to make it. So it's less of a, like for, like for duel, just less of a rush fest, I think now in RF. I mean, it's still a rush fest, but now you build a little bit more before you rush. I mean, there were there were some really good uh, bug fixes as well. I'm scrolling down to those for those of you watching, and I mean, look at that. They fixed an issue preventing water natural wonders from appearing on huge maps. Now we don't play a lot of huge maps here in CPL. Most of our players seem to prefer eight-player games, but once you get up to those 12-man games and you do set it to huge, all your water natural wonders are gone. Well, thankfully, you guys could get those back. Did that also include water resources as well? Mm, does not say. Well, we've been running. It's more stable. I think we, people agree that the RF is more stable than the uh, vanilla. Cause we, so, well, I've seen people try, doing a 12-man. I don't know how it turned out if it if it finished, but I've, see, I've seen people doing 12-mans. I have done several 12s and even more 10s. And yes, it from what we started out as, it's a lot more stable. It, it, it still gets slow. Yeah, it, it's kind of balanced since a couple patches ago. Uh, but before, we would 
steer clear of tens and not even think to do twelves. But now, I mean, we've done quite a few successful successful twelves. Yeah, I'm in a ten right now, and it's going really smooth. I'm at turn thirty seven. Yeah, I mean, we've gone up to eighties and nineties with no DCs. You know, I'm always really glad to hear that they're doing multiplayer balance fixes and, you know, just quality of life updates for keeping people connected. Because they're always very ambiguous about it. It's always multiplayer fixes in progress or multiplayer stability improved. We're never really given much of anything to go with from Firaxis on this. So we're just kind of jumping some hurdles as we go. And I, I considerably hope that this latest uh, dev update did improve multiplayer connections because just last week we had issues where we were in a six-man, seven-man, eight-man game and you have people disconnecting, desyncing, and then four four-man game later, no problems at all. Eight-man game, no problems at all. It's just every once in a while everything starts hiccuping like crazy and no, no one's too sure what's going on. None of the people in the said game I'm referencing had bad PCs. They had good internet connections. So it wasn't their hardware. Oh, Blade, do you yeah, want to talk about one of the bigger uh, stuff that's not in the patch? Or uh, the Great General fix? Oh, yeah. They uh, they fixed the Great Generals. Uh, prior to the, the... I can't talk. Prior to the expansion coming out, if your general was within two tiles, it would apply the movement bonus, the plus one, to any unit that is within its, what, 27 tiles, I believe? Within two range, any unit gets the plus one movement. And so if you have a sword, you're now at three movement. If you move outside of the radius of the um, general, you still have the plus three. When the expansion came out, you were able to manipulate your general to where, like, your your sword has three movement, but if you move outside of the zone of the general, it automatically loses that plus one movement. So it would kind of screw you over sometimes and get units stuck on other units because if you click one unit that or one tile that is beyond another one of your units at its max range, but then it loses the bonus from the general it would glitch and get stuck on one unit. But you were also able to attack, if you got a promotion, you could pull out your general and then move it back within two tiles, and then now you could promote it again. You, you weren't able to move it again, but you could still promote, which that ability was huge. And they if got rid of the unit. plus five, That does. they got rid of that stacking too, right? That was with the expansion, yes. But now it is back to what it originally was, meaning the movement is applied at the turnover. And if you leave the area of the general, it still applies and you can't move your general back and forth and now attack and promote the same turn. So I'm, I'm kind of on the fence with it. It made for different strategies to move the general back and forth. So you could still get your promotions off the same turn, but and it's, I'm kind of glad that it got fixed. Are people still mostly doing uh, rule A for the classic old generals? I uh, yeah. Um, every one of my games I play is always a teamer, and it has never not been rule A. Yeah, all the FFAs I've been playing in, it, rule A is winning the votes. So I think that's. The, the accepted standard of using classical generals here? It's because no one likes games being over based on the first few turns, simply because whoever has more chops to project the general wins. Or, you know, God forbid someone gets more than one. See, in the ADCP, we don't we don't have any of the... All, the only thing we banned is Defender of the Faith, so we, we're happy. To, I'm, if I see games ending fast, I'm like, oh, thank thank you, Jesus, because the games are going long, like two more hours, so, and we're, you know, we're doing three out of five, so it, shorter games will be... I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. Actually, we have someone from chat saying Rule B has been gaining in popularity. What's Rule B? You can, you can only leave them in your uh, territory. You can't take them out of your territory? That's rule A. So what's yeah? What's rule? I don't even know what rule B is. Then 
I've never seen a game with rule B. But what what actually is rule B? It's so it's so infrequently used that we don't even know what rule B is anymore. <laughs> <laughs> like, do we? Do we not? Like, I know I don't know what it is, but I figure one of you guys. Rule probably B know. is when you use the classical general with medieval units, so you can move him out alongside medieval units only, and people have been enjoying it a lot simply because unless you get Sun Tzu as your classical general, you kind of get the shaft. Because at least you can retire him for a great work. But what's the point of having a classical general with medieval units? Just the he scouting affects everything? classical and medieval. A general oh, affects, affects their oh, current okay. era and the next oh. era of units. It's but the not the previous Adams. era. It doesn't affect the ancient. It doesn't go backwards. No, it does not go backwards. Like You have a classical medieval... You have medieval renaissance, you have renaissance industrial, industrial modern. You always get two areas with your general. Just except ancient. Ooh. So, one thing that they did work on, I'd like to highlight, is the city banner polish and bug fixes. I really like it when they do quality of life updates like this, where they focus on highlighting and making things a little more, to where they stand out more. Another prime example of this that came from this update was you can see what your allies are researching. No, oh my can't. god. What? It's, nope. They said we could. If you have a level 3 research alliance only. Oh my god. So essentially, I, I'm glad you brought this up because I was going to do it myself. Th this change is essentially useless because you hardly ever get to level 3 until unless your game goes all the way up to modern. Is that a problem, though? Isn't that one of the things you're definitely going to be discussing with your partner, with your uh, teammates, what they're researching, so you guys, uh, you know, I, sync I, on the boost and everything? <laughs> this is designed for AI, because when you're teching things, you don't know what AI is teching if they're on your your alliance. So now, when you have a level three, it now shows. But this change needs to be changed to be allowed for, like teamers because that's an automatic alliance or as soon as you get civil service and declare alliance within like an ffa game that needs to get changed not applied only to a level three alliance that means that, that so are teamers are teamers going longer too i know the ffas and the duels yes. are going longer teamers are longer too teamers are like minimum four hours at least six hours if not seven or eight for like what? Like a what? What have you done the two v twos lately? I uh, no, it's all been five v five and six v six. But I mean, yeah, I wonder why people don't do more. These games are going. I'm I'm seeing a lot more tanks come into play because the game is going on that much longer. I mean, I'm yeah, glad I've seen that too. Modern armor, and we've actually had two space races in the last week or so that I've been in. And that was like unheard of, right? You never get space. I never hear the word space and, and FFA or anything or team are ever rarely used in the same sentence but no, in the, the past. Would get called. That's because people like to give up. Yep. I mean, I was in a... Was it a 5v5? I lost three out of my five members but me and my partner were essentially simming the entire game and the other team was like just cc I'm like no we have better score better science and so we're gonna win like we hit takes first and didn't really push into them but how the line took over like one or two cities and we went all the way to space they Every single one of their team had all of their spies in my cities, so I had no chance. <laughs> so they beat me out by like two, two or three turns to a space race. Sarnath is does Iron Man style with casting. He never no breaks. No, no. It's all it's always Iron Man for Sarnath when he casts. 
Not always, but we do have another comment from our viewers in the chat. We did have a culture victory yesterday in the 3v3 game. A culture victory. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> like, seriously, was that was that like Congo selling some jeans or? Well, if you get that, what's the one where you get the the triple? You get the triple uh, culture from the from your um. What's the word I'm looking the for? Through your relics. There's that one faith that you can oh, not a faith. Yeah. It's a the government building. It's a card, right? You get and you get triple triple power from your relics. That that definitely is a big help in that direction. Yeah. It used to be a uh, pantheon. It used to be for tourism, is what it tripled, and it was uh, it was really great, especially if you were Poland and you were playing for that. Oh, you get so much from your relics. I think culture, it's nice that culture is not like, a, I think definitely a lot more important now. At least I noticed in duels, it's more like, you, it's more important to focus on like you, they seem, than before it seems. So for everyone out there. Culture is go way ahead. more important now because like more culture, more governors. The faster you get your governors, the faster you could chop stuff out, the faster you could start building other things, the faster you get Magnus, faster you get Armani. So yeah, culture is way more important, which is why Rome is basically on the ban list. So I have some horrible news out there for everyone who's really been loving observation balloons lately. Uh... They've been giving the drones combat strength bonus. They're not supposed to do that. Well, that's been fixed, so you guys are probably going to hate your observation balloons now. What about the yeah. drones? Are people using those? Are people building the drones? <laughs> they didn't they have to. The balloon was given the bonus. Yeah. But, I mean, oh, so you don't even... Oh, but... They will now. <laughs> so you're saying the balloons were just functioning like a drone, basically? Yeah. Yes. Sixed an issue where observation balloons were incorrectly granting the drone unit's combat strength bonus. And people are Oops. using spies a lot more now? That, that's... Oh yeah, everyone's using spies. They're assassinating you're loving, you're loving that, right? Because you're, you're the one that was always saying spies were underutilized, and so now you oh, must be man. loving that. that... I, I'm thrilled. I was tickled pink when I saw that they were putting more stuff out there for spies to do. Spies to do. So was yeah, I. Was I. I mean, France, I, every time France comes up in my pick, I'm picking it. I love France. Yeah, it's them. no yeah. longer a, a ditch sieve. It's now freaking tier two. I played them when they were a ditch sieve. You can jump off this bandwagon. Hey, I'm the first one to admit I'm on the bandwagon. Because <laughs> so. I, I, I banned her in every game of mine because she was shit. And now... I'm like, bring her on. I'll take France. I'll get that plus three combat strength automatically. And I'll get my free spy and kill all your envoys. Like, I don't care playing with Greece and I'll kill your envoys. Doesn't so, matter. here's another thing that's been added that is really worth addressing. Added loyalty per turn to emergency target cities so that emergencies will no longer end in the members' favor without them doing anything. So now, if I take a city-state that I would normally raise because I can't keep it for loyalty reasons, I could keep it, hope to pop an emergency, and then not lose it to loyalty. Yeah, that is a good change because, like, people were losing emergencies or winning them in a couple of turns because it would flip to neutral. So people weren't doing, weren't you saying that people just were skipping emergencies because the other side realized it's either too easy for the one side or, and, and so people just weren't even doing them, right? Well, I, emergencies pop up all the time. It's just, it all depends on where the city is located, which city is the emergency for, and can you get your shit over that city in time to take it over? A lot of the times, it's either A, too far away, B, you're not going to be able to take it and get there on time, or you're not going to be able to hold it and it'll flip, or, or they capture the city and just burn it. Because emergency will still pop up, but you have to decline it because the city is no longer there. So, here's another thing out there. 
for all of our Dutch fans out there, I don't know if you love playing the Dutch Civ. Just thrilled to have your Civ added if you are Dutch. But how happy are you to see this balance change come out? Allow the three land tiles next to the polder to include hills. How many of you out there have been completely screwed out of making your polder improvement because there was a flippin' hill there? I was. I mean, it, it was basically useless because you had three tiles. It, it's bad enough to get, like, a polder tile that is, like, touching three land, three land tiles. And then you have one of them a hill, and you're just like, really? I can't build it because of a hill? So, I'm glad that got changed. I think that was one of the biggest things that went against the Dutch. Was as soon as people realized, hey, wait a minute. I can't make a polder if there's a hill here. No one wanted to play the Dutch after that. So maybe we'll see some love come the Dutch's way from the community. And see them get picked a little more often now. I mean, I would pick the Dutch. Like, I pick the Dutch all the time on Fractal. Because, I mean, those frigates are awesome. Oh, here's one. So, everyone out there has realized that Norway is kind of scary now. Because, well, oligarchy affects their boats. And their boats were kind of ignorable before because you can just kill them with a couple archers. Well, we've already gone over the nerfs to ranged units against ships and the increased bonus for artillery units against ships. But now... The Twilight Valor card applies to naval melee units. So you can see a Dark Age Norway come through and swipe everything of yours that's on the coast. Plus it's like a scout that can go anywhere and just pick up even more like uh, you know, of the goody hut so you can help with your era score. Yeah, I mean there there was a, there's a lot going for Norway in the expansion and with this Twilight Valor, so if I get a Dark Age Norway there, you got a snowball's chance in hell of stopping me from taking that coastal city. You have all, yeah, that's a plus nine automatically. Like, that, that's scary. I, the ship can't heal outside of my territory anyway, so I don't care that it can't heal. Long ships can. Well, yeah, the long ships can, but even then, most but people yes. don't think about that. At least you can pop your. At least you can have your your crossbow and then get the two range shooting at the ships now if you're on the wall so that nothing. leaves it literally does nothing to that long boat it's like minus oh, because they're... damage you oh because yeah right they nerfed the they nerfed the uh the damage from crossbows right and then archers against all the ranged range. units do like <laughs> jack field to boats cannon. field cannons before used to like two shot frigates guaranteed now i mean field cannons not gonna do anything it's gonna do like quarter damage to a frigate maybe if it's got a promotion or two. Ne Neutralize governor turn duration has been adjusted for game speed. So for all you spy people out there, you'd kick the governor out and he'd be gone for, for quite a while. It seemed like forever if you were playing on online speed. Well, that's going to adjust now. So it's going to be half the time that governor is going to be gone. No warranted, it's going to eject him to the pool... So he's got to be reassigned. But this does slightly nerf that mission for spies on online speed games where multiplayer is played. So that what is... What does it change it to now? Because originally it was like, what, six? Eight turns? It'll be half for online speed. Half of what it already is. So it'll only be four turns? Yep, and then he'll be available in your governor pool again. So... This is a bit of a uh, survival quality of life increase for the assailed player from spies. You should be counter spying with your spies if this is happening to you. Especially there's a France in the game, but good luck catching that spy. Ooh, gain sources turn duration has been adjusted for game speed. So this means spies are going to be moving missions faster. Because before, if you were playing on standard or online, it didn't matter. You would have to wait, I want to say it's 10 turns for gain sources. Is it 4? Is it 4 now, or was it 4 before? It was 4 before. That means it's 2 turns for gain sources on online speed. Your spies are going to be cracking their first missions out of those cities real quick.
for all of you single player people out there, there were a lot of AI updates. I mean, I say a lot, it's only three lines on this, but, I mean, if you look at the city-state changes to where the city-states will defend themselves more, that's a hit to the AI in terms of you people that love playing on the higher difficulties. Improvements in sorting great works into collections. So if you loved watching Congo kick your butt in culture generation before, you're going to love them even more now. Because they're going to have those great works sorted properly. Improved AI progress through the tech and civic tree. I'm not entirely certain what this means. Does this mean that we're going to see the AI beelining for certain techs based on what civ they are? I mean, not a lot, of, not a lot to go on here. So in the new, what's the uh, consensus of, like, what are the new OP civs now that people have played this a while? It's all broken. It's all OP. I mean, it really depends on the, the whoever's got the helm, you know? Who's, at, who's driving the ship? That's really what's determining what's good and what's not. Because a really good player can take any civ and win a game with it. So, so what's it, being banned? Like, Rome's being banned all the time? Yep. Uh, Germany, Scythia, Australia. Well, Australia, not as much, but everyone cries, you know, abuse whenever someone declares war in Australia, so they probably got banned too a lot. I mean, it's you, you can't sort civs into tiers. I see the discussion come up all the time in the community. Oh, a tier list for civs. This civ is top tier. This civ is bottom tier. It depends on the start that you get. It depends who your neighbors are. It depends on the players of those neighbors, not to mention their civs. Because more aggressive players won't do diplomacy with you, and others will. There's too many other factors at play. Making a tier list is honestly just a waste of time. Yeah, I agree. It's very situational, and uh, people ban civs more out of fear than knowledge sometimes. Yeah, people, I, I always say people ban things too too quickly. It's like a couple people don't like something, and they just get some ball of you know, momentum, and they just, oh, just ban it without even like fully testing it, like, like anything, like uh, bonuses or whatever. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, the community is going to vote to ban things based on their lobbies, and they might target ban civs because they've seen people get really out of hand with a certain civ before. So there's also that factor, because the human, the human element plays a huge role in our games, and it's always meant to be. You never really know exactly what someone's going to do, but once you get a general feel for their game style, you know, for example, you know, Harambe is a simmer. As death's more aggressive. You usually you, tar you try to target banned civs to where the more ag early aggression civs get banned out of the pool so that they don't have a chance to draw those civs and really capitalize on their play style. So you see a lot of that going on as well. If Cizop's in the game, ban Germany, ban Russia. Otherwise, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Wrecked. Yes, and uh, I mean we can transition into this. Uh, we're we're starting to master rise and fall, and uh, we're about to announce the solid dates for the third Clan Championship Cup on the first uh, to the third of June. Yeah, I know. I'm super excited for another CCC to roll around. We had an amazing turnout. We had amazing support from viewers all over the world. The games were fantastic. The players had a great time. We had tons of feedback from the community at large, not just our local community. So that was absolutely fantastic. Even my son's excited about the news, as you probably heard. And it's just absolutely phenomenal to see the entire Civ community just come together like this over a great event. There's no money. It's not a cash tournament or cash event. There doesn't need to be money involved for it to draw the community together. It's just a whole lot of people from all over the world representing their communities, their clans, their organizations, and just duking it out. And it's been absolutely phenomenal. 
And we, we purposely pushed the clan championship cup a little bit to the right because, because rise and fall came out. Um, and we wanted everyone to uh, have time to at least become good at this game. So, but uh, come the beginning of June, we're going to have three days of awesome clan matches, the best players in the world uh, slugging it up with each other. Yeah, that should be. We should we'll see some. We'll probably do another Iron Man. That was that was uh, in the last. The CC had had one Iron Man, right? Iron Man FFA. FFA that was. That. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we'll keep the core events like the Iron Man and and the uh, series of duels we'll play out during the weekend. Um, we we always hardcore some events because as an administration we feel that they're important, and then we let the players vote on uh, you know three of the events and pick the winners. Yeah, and it's it's great to have community involvement like that as well, because these events are community driven. These are for the people by the people, so to speak, and it's it's been great. It really has. We've always had a lot of people turn out to put in their vote for ideas. People suggest new game types and modes. We always get new ideas from people, and it's it's great. I'm very. I take a lot of pride in being able to do that with this community. For certain. And I mean, and just like you speaking of transitions here, talking from one event to another, we've had the ADCP kickoff. Louis, tell us what's been going on with that. It's the first week of it. I saw brackets get posted. Everyone's excited and hyped up, getting matches done, completing, of, completing their rounds. What's been going on? Yeah, it's going pretty well. We always knew, because basically what what we did was uh, to try to get more people to play, we let people schedule their own matches. So they just have like a certain amount of time. So this is like a four week event because it's like one of our biggest tier events. We call a Grand Slam. So I just named it the Australian Open just just to blatantly rip off tennis. Because I'm not ripping off you as the homage to tennis. I'll call it that. But yeah, so it's our biggest tier event. It's the 32 draw and it goes four weeks. And so, you know, of course, I was worried that, you know, people wouldn't get their matches done. But so far, most of the people we got uh, one, two, three. For six people into the no eight eight people have gone into the second round already. Task Force Fish under Harambe, Rolf, Adamation, Mysterious X, Yoshi, and Pavlo. So, so we're getting pretty good, and they're all three zero. I'm I'm the only one that's one one. Every every one so far has been a three zero. <laughs> Jeez. Well, it is the first uh, first event. We'll have to wait and see if these people can be consistent with these records, and that is one of the biggest things that you've emphasized for the ADCP is it's we're going to see who's consistently winning over the span of this year long event and it's it's going to be pretty cool to watch it's going to be a great system I think yeah thanks I think it's just yeah it's just like different I mean people have to get I'm, I'm sure most of the people really have no idea how the system works but they'll they'll see over time how the points get accumulated in what which tournaments they you know they want to play in and it should be. It's it's totally yeah, it's totally different than the Elo system. It's it's all based on just your result. It it really has nothing to do with who you beat. That that has zero effect on your ranking. It's all just how you do, how far you advance in the tournament, and what how big the tournament was that you did well in. It's yeah, it had nothing. You don't get bonus points for beating a top player or anything. It's uh, so it's totally in that sense. It's totally the opposite of the Elo system that we have in the in our, our ranking system. Oh, definitely interesting for sure. Do you guys? Ha how do you plan on handling the uh, quarter, semi, and grand finals for this event? Well, we don't. I don't think we are, we're always happy to have people stream. So yeah, we'd be be uh, thrilled if you want to stream any of the our you know later round events. But we don't we don't have a specific uh, schedule. But I think we would you know prefer that the players you know play you know, that get in the deeper rounds try to play them some of the least some of the games on the weekend so more people could could follow it but we don't have a specific uh it's just it's basically like almost every they have like about a week or six days five days to finish each round so it's not uh yeah there's no specific you know times but yeah we will encourage especially towards the you know semifinals finals for the players to try to play when there's more people who could watch and we'll try to get people to stream like you and and like uh, Canuck and Task Force, unless he's playing, he is our number one seed, so he may not be available for uh, for streaming. 
Well, we'll just have to wait and see. I'm definitely excited to see how things play out, so I wish you the best of luck with that event. And Canuck, yeah, thanks. we have here mentioned the, C the new CPL newsletter. Could you go explain that for all of our viewers out there? What, what is the CPL newsletter? I thought we had a news channel. Well, the CPL newsletter is what we decided rather than randomly posting tidbits uh, once in a while that the players, uh, you know, may be confused about or they get overloaded with news. We've decided to make a more formalized uh, uh, post in that news where all of the, you know, basically, you know, non, you know, time sensitive news can all get wrapped up into a very nice package and post it for the players to read all at once. And uh, and we feel that, you know, the players will enjoy this more. It's a more effective way of delivering, um, and, you know, all the stuff that's going on in the community to the players uh, in, a, in a weekly time where it'll be Saturday, post it sa every Saturday. Uh, players will know that there'll be a newsletter every Saturday and uh, and they can enjoy a little bit of reading on the weekends. Yeah, that's a much better way of doing because unfortunately there's everybody, including me, abuses the everyone tag and so news often gets lost among the other 800 everyone's that people are putting out there so this this will get yeah more people and they'll know when to tune in to read it so i think that'll be a big it'll get a lot more people reading the news and knowing what's going on well um, i was pretty excited by one thing that i did read in it and that was the featured streamer part because we did have someone get recognized for a lot of work that they've put in especially in our in our russian community because we have had a large number of russian players join recently and it was th thanks partially if not a large part to a streamer by begro and He's done a phenomenal job reaching out to people, guiding them here, helping some of the players that still struggle with English understand the rules. If I'm not mistaken, he helped with some translations for our rules to make that easier for our Russian players. So he's really stepped up as an individual, and I think it's fantastic that we're taking, taking a step forward as an administrative staff to recognize those individuals that are standing out. Yeah, for certain. I mean, um, we towed ourselves as an international uh, Civ fan site for multiplayer, and it's great to see other communities out there um, come and join us. I mean, we have a strong uh, French community, we have a strong Korean community, a strong Russian community, and uh, we have to reach out to them, and uh, you know, so that we're all playing in the same place as, as a community here. I mean, the more players, the better. The more players from around the world means games 24 and 7. So anything we can do to make life easier for these people that, you know, English is not their first language, to integrate into a place where, for better or for worse, English is the international language. But we have to bridge that gap so that we're all playing together, having a lot of great games, and, you know, maybe we'll get a couple more clans forming before, uh, before the next CCC out of this. So what's the, uh, what's the, is there a, I know there's a ability to like in the chat with Twitch that you can translate, uh, any most languages, but is there, is there some program that you can translate what the, uh, streamer is saying in, into, into what your, whatever your language is? Not that I'm aware of. No, that isn't something readily available to most people. And to quickly interject here, uh, a viewer from our chat has mentioned that Shami was actually the translator for the Russian language of that. So a huge shout out to you, Shami. Thanks for stepping up and really helping those people out there. I personally am a huge, huge believer of always paying that goodwill forward. Is that so, me the bus? Is that who you're talking yes. about? Yes. So uh, really good on you, man. And I sincerely hope that you continue to stand out in such a positive light and keep pushing that goodwill forward to the other people out there that were struggling to understand because their English just isn't that great yet. You know, because learning new languages is hard. It's difficult because you always want to revert back to what you know. So good on you, man, and thanks a lot. And we did have Baba. We did have Baba yet to come in and play a game. I think once or twice. That would be a huge boost to the community if we get him into Civ Six because he has a huge 
as I said before, he's got a really big following. People like that generally play streams on games on a schedule, and it's difficult to fit other things into that schedule. But I'm just happy to see him playing some. I, I figure I'm hoping over time he'll get a little a bored or more curious about six and play 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 that more, and then that would that would definitely boost our members because he he has lots of uh, definitely a huge following. There are plenty of streamers out there for that, not just him. So, I mean, it is what it is. If they come here and play, great. If they don't come here and play, great. I mean, this is already an amazing community to be in. It's already packed full tons of people from all over the world. It already is the best place to be. I mean, people are always more than welcome to join. They're always welcome here. There's always games going on. And it's, you know, it's already a great place. So by yeah, all I think means, we're gonna have that, if you want to come we're gonna have games, the, you come here. I think I think we're gonna have the ten thousand. It's, it's party that I that I'm only one that knows about, but I think I still tell myself it's gonna happen. Our ten thousand games online party that we're gonna have. That, that I'm the only one talking about it, but I, I think I still think it's gonna happen. Well, we're we're closing in on five thousand games right now, so um, that's awesome. Yeah, absolutely, and it just goes to show how people have come together, and it's self-revitalized, really. There was a bit of a slump during uh, the, especially the Persia DLC that caused all sorts of nightmares, and it's very, very nice to see things recoup over time, especially with Rise and Fall's release, so it's been absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, that's right. We're about halfway there. We're, we're, we we may already be at 5,000 games. We just haven't because there's always a little delay in the reporting. So we, we're very close to actually officially reporting. Officially, a history have 1,000 games. Yes, we are. It won't take long. And I would like to shout out to all the game reporters that we have that have been churning through all the reports. And these are community volunteers that are spending their time doing something that's a, it's a tad monotonous. But uh, we're doing it on behalf of the players to report all the games to my league. Uh, and there's been an explosion of games. So this is, uh, you know, not an undaunting task. Hey, Canuck. Turn's ending. I'm good. <laughs> but, I mean, that Can just goes to show people stepping up in the community. It's community-driven. And that's what this is all about. That's what the CPL is all about. It's about the community. And that's exactly what it's been for almost 20 years now and will continue to be in the future. I just like the way the CPL is like, you know, it's like a living organism. So it, it's, you know, uh, adapting and moving over time. It's no longer like just very quickly when I first came in, as everybody can, there was not hardly any duels. I don't think there was even that many teamers yet and now teamers are maybe even more popular than ffas and duels are more popular so it's yes yeah, which i like how there's it's not just the same every month after month it's like just changing over time well i mean it, it's it's hearts and minds louis i mean you gotta if you want a certain game mode to happen more often you gotta really push it out there like you did with duels like Blade and a lot of the other usual hardcore teamer players out there were pushing and pushing and pushing. Now there's a lot more teamer games. You know, people that prefer to play with some mods, they've been trying and trying and trying, and they usually got hard stopped by people. And they've slowly been happening. It's still very slow development, but they do happen. Yeah, you just have to you just have to be persistent and lead it. You can't yeah, you can't just go, Oh, does anybody want to play a mod game and then just get you have to just keep you have to host it and just keep pounding away at it. I'm sure I don't know when when it started to get the teamers going blade, but I'm sure at the beginning it was frustrating for you not getting a lot. I don't know when that was. Well, what was frustrating about doing teamers in the beginning was not having designated teamers. So you couldn't assign team one, team two and so forth. You just had to make the teams in the lobby and not be able to have shared vision until you actually make find them and drop pins. So people didn't want to hassle with that. But what, as soon as teams were established in the game lobby, it c caught on a little bit more and we just kept pushing through. And there's but like another an early part in chat. We've had four scenario games in the last two weeks. So even the scenarios are getting played more. 
Yeah, I think there's some confusion on that too. Like I used to think of a mod game. I th- when I think of a mod game, I thought of those scenarios. But so I think there's sometimes there's a confusion on what a, a mod game really is not. That's not really a mod game. But I think other people probably get confused like me and think of those scenario games. You know, the little package ones like the Nuclear War and the those. But those really are scenario games. But I think some people like me are, were calling them mod games. So sometimes it gets a little confusing. But it, it's definitely a testament. To, sh- to really show how far the community's come, where you only, only would see free-for-alls. Now you see duels, free-for-alls, teamers, you, you see mod games, scenarios being played. You know, it's, it's really come a long way, and it's going to continue to evolve. Just like you said, Louis, it's like a living organism. As the community grows and develops, so too do these changes. And sometimes people are stubborn, but the dedication from those really wanting to push their ideas out there it slowly starts to change and and that's exactly what's been happening and it's it's been absolutely incredible to watch the process yeah that, i'd like to see maybe I mean, that happens in the ccc the thing i would like to see for the ffa people is to just that the, the top people play each other more often it seems like there's like you know one players over here and then the other top players over there I'd, I'd like to see i know we have the premier club but that's not always it's not always uh like frequented by people so but that's that is one time where you do see let mostly top players play but i'd like to see more of that like the top you know, like top a uh, eight player game when it's all like top 20 people or something But I think this is where we're going to wrap up the podcast for this week. So thanks not only my co-host, King Louis XIV, but also to our guests for tonight, Connect Soldier and Blade 7. Thanks a lot for coming out, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and uh, we'll do this again. Yeah, thanks for thanks for coming on, guys, and thanks for listening, everybody. Huge thanks to all of our viewers and supporters out there, whether you're joining us on Twitch, YouTube Live, or over on Bigstat.tv, or if you're one of our viewers later on down the road, where you're tuning in later, watching the videos on YouTube or past broadcasts on Twitch. Thank you very much for your viewership and support. It's because of you guys that we continue to do this, for all of you people out there. And we really look forward to seeing you guys next time.